A couple who seem to have it all. Wealthy people who can afford chalets and nice cars and beautiful boats. Then, a deadly crash, a frantic call. Yeah, I was throwing out and walking down the hill. An apparently perfect marriage shattered by tragedy. I wanted to stop, it didn't stop. But investigators are suspicious. Bells and whistles for me started, you know, singing. And a sinister dark side is revealed. He wanted a lot more money than he had coming. That's what made him so scary. He was a control freak. A beautiful marriage that went downhill fast. Tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Headquarters of the Nevada Highway Patrol, just past midnight, June 1st, 1998. Okay, sir, where are you? Dispatch gets this frantic phone call from a guy who's on the side of a mountain. They, they don't know where he is. Sir, sir, calm down. Where are you? Sir, sir, I need you to calm down. Where are you? The Sierra Nevadas are truly spectacular, but one slip of the steering wheel on those narrow switchbacks and you can cash in your chips. Apparently, this notorious stretch of highway had claimed another victim. On the computer screen, the dispatcher knows that he's on a cell phone, but she doesn't know exactly where he is, so she's trying to pinpoint his location. I need you to take a cup of breath and then tell me where you're at. My car's down the hill. My wife in the car. He is screaming about himself and about his wife. Okay, we'll get someone right out there. You're on which mountain are you at? That could be only one place, and that was the Mount Rose Ski Resort. That's about 25 miles southwest of Reno. What was relayed to us was that he was he had just left the ski area and was driving down the road and ended up going through the guardrail. It took in the neighborhood of like 20 minutes to get from down here in Reno up on the Mount Rose. As the troopers begin searching the mountain roads, the 911 operator presses the caller for more details. What's your name, honey? <laughs> Peter, you're doing really good. I need you to take a couple breaths and then tell me where you're at. We were all kind of like going in circles trying to find him while our dispatch center was talking to him on the telephone and trying to get further information. We were coming to have As we're going up the mountain, we're asking dispatch if he can hear our sirens because we don't know where he's at. What I want you to do is I want you to listen through the sirens. Yes, ma'am. And we're going to have a bunch of lights, and I need you to tell me when they get close to you so we can find you. Yes, ma'am. As we made our way up, we got to an area that, that basically overlooks the valley, and Trooper McClellan was a couple seconds ahead of me. I came upon a big section of the guardrail missing. And I radioed that I'm th pretty sure I found the location. They're looking at you from the road, and they're going to look for you from the sky. So I see lights. I hear them right there. I went to the edge and looked down, and I could hear someone saying, I'm down here. And then I went down to his location. I believe it was right around 80 plus feet where he was located, where I found him, and he was laying face down. He was laying with his head on his phone, talking on his phone when I got there. 
Within minutes, Trooper Schilling arrives on the scene. And one of the things that struck me as odd was there was a, a ball cap laying pretty much right in the gap area. And it said incline on it. And I didn't really pay too much attention to it at first, but I traveled pretty much right over the top of it. And Trooper McClellan yelled to me that he found one person was told there was another person in the vehicle still that was several hundred feet below him. And I began my trek down the, the hillside to him. <laughs> We did have a helicopter, which is called our Flight for Life helicopter, in route because of the seriousness of the uh, accident. Um, we also had other emergency people that were on their way up. As they wait for help, they try to assess Peter's injuries. He basically stated that his back was hurt and his legs were hurt and that he couldn't move his legs. They didn't see any bleeding. He wasn't bleeding from the face or arms or legs. or It didn't appear legs were contorted in, uh, uh, at an odd angle. He had some dirt on him, but it was pretty much isolated to the back of his pants, his rear end and his leg area. His hair wasn't really out of place. Rescue workers and police backup arrive on the road above. My next step was I needed to get down to that vehicle and find out who was in it and their condition. I was able to follow the debris trail, the stuff coming out of the truck. Schilling and McClellan find the vehicle about 700 feet further down the mountain. It was so damaged that it was very hard to determine which part of the vehicle was front, which part was back. It was upside down with the front of it facing back up the hill. I ended up prying the door open and you could see um, the passenger in there, not moving or anything. I pulled the female out of the vehicle to where I could get a good pulse. I got nothing in the arm. I went to the carotid, and there was no pulse. The victim is Renette Riella Bergna, and the survivor is her husband, Peter. They're from Incline Village, an affluent enclave on the shores of Lake Tahoe, just a few miles away. Trevor Schilling went back up to begin coordinating everything to get the body removed and get the truck removed. Peter Bergna is flown to a nearby hospital. As his wife's body is removed from the wreckage, the investigation into the cause of the tragic accident begins. What a way to go. Strapped inside a pickup, plunging 800 feet down in pitch darkness. It's the stuff of nightmares. But when the sun rose the next day, new light would be shed on this terrible accident. And believe me, not everything was as it appeared. This accident happened on a little lip on the side of an 8,200 foot mountain. It's like standing on the rim of the world. Hours after rescuing Peter Bergner from the side of a mountain near Reno, Nevada, firemen have finally managed to pull his wife Renette's body from the wreckage. We did eventually call for the coroner to respond. We were able to place her into a bag and put her into and carry her back up the hillside. And we started clearing the scene and starting to assess it, begin our photographs and start doing our investigation. They find three empty gas cans between the wreckage and where Peter was found. We started looking for the things that we should see in traffic accidents skid marks, signs of someone trying to break, losing control of a vehicle, roadway marks that you would expect to find at a crash scene. There was no, literally there was no roadway marks at all. That's the best way I can say it. And we don't know why the vehicle eventually went through the guardrail and down the hillside. There was no steering maneuver. Um, there was really nothing. So at that point in time, short of talking to the gentleman that was medevaced out of there, um, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered. It, it didn't make sense. We have a hole through the heavy guardrail, and it looks like it went straight through. With nothing to show any kind of accident or force pushing the car that way, it had to be steered. As they continue combing the area for clues, an unexpected visitor arrives. It had been a couple hours into it, and 
and a vehicle pulled up into the scene. And the passenger is this Peter, who just hours earlier was incapacitated, maybe even paralyzed, couldn't move his legs, was on the side of the hill. Well, it was kind of surprising he was back at the scene. After he tells me he believes his legs are broken or his back is broken, and he's fine. Miraculously, Peter survived the accident with barely a scratch. He has a small, a minor fracture to one of his ankles. Bells and whistles, for me, started, <laughs> you know, singing. They press Bergner for more details about the night before. I want to talk to him about why he was up there in the circumstances surrounding the uh, vehicle going through the guardrail. He states he's coming down the road and, and, and he's trying to push the brakes, but the brakes weren't working. At that point, Schilling asked the question that everybody has on their mind. I ask him why he doesn't steer away from the, the hillside, and he says, he just kind of gives me one of those, shakes the head, and says, that's a good question. I asked him how he managed to get on the hillside, and he stated that after the truck went through the guardrail, that he was ejected out the driver's window. As investigators search for more clues, Peter hovers over them, watching their every move. He asked me if I found his purse. And I said, oh, like a fanny pack? And he said, yeah, did you find my, my purse in the car? And I sat there for a second, and I went, you know, I don't think we found that yet. And one of the reasons why I was a little bit thrown back on that is there was no question about his wife or anything at all about the condition of his wife. She was less than 10 feet from the car on the side of the road. In the body bag, just laying there, waiting to be taken to the coroner's office. No motion, no nothing. Um, didn't appear to be any more than just somebody, a casual observer. It just didn't make me feel right. I wouldn't necessarily say that I arose to a conclusion, but I would definitely say that the hairs on the back of my neck were starting to stand up and that there needed to be some further follow-up investigation and questioning. Either the altitude was getting to Peter Bergner or something was very wrong with this picture. The investigators' search for the truth was about to take them on a path as twisted and treacherous as the Mount Rose Highway itself. In the days after the accident that claimed Renette Bergner's life, investigators conduct several interviews with her husband, Peter, trying to reconstruct the crash. Somehow I got out of the truck. I don't know if I opened the door. My window was open. The more they question Peter, the less sure the police are about his story. Some things happened up there that need to be told to me that haven't been told to me yet. And it can only come from you. Because you're the only one alive that's left there to say that. A suspicious death with only one witness. To get to the bottom of this so-called accident, cops were going to have to take a closer look at the Bergner's life on the shore of Lake Tahoe. Incline Village, where Peter Bergner lived, was a upper middle class, to upper class mountain community. This is pretty wealthy people who can afford chalets and nice cars and beautiful boats. Peter Bergner was an art appraiser for Butterfield and Butterfield. And he knew his stuff. He was, he was good. He was good at what he did. Peter is the adopted son of Pat and Louis Bergner, a renowned and very successful district attorney. Young Peter wasn't born with a silver spoon, but once he got a hold of one, he couldn't let go. Peter was the kind of guy who prided himself on having the best wines and the best artwork and the best antiques. Everything had its value. Everything, you know, lots of antiques. He did, he had a nice collection. He had a, a very nice wine cellar. He wanted to have this wine that cost $100 a bottle, and it's not because he drank it or appreciated it. He just wanted to be able to tell people that he had it. At the time of the accident, Renette and Peter had been married for 10 years. Renette was a trained pharmacist. She was president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Nevada for one year, and she enjoyed her work. She, she was a very good pharmacist. She was the sister everybody wants. I mean, she was loving and, and kind and always remembered your birthday, your anniversary, all those important dates. Oh, your little tree? Sweet tree. Tree. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Now, now tell them what you told me. It's very old. It's very old. Very old. 
Well, John, it's a very priceless piece. And if you're a good person, you no, may get one day. <laughs> She's just a really great person. Here already. <laughs> Hello, Peter. Come on, Peter. Oh, oh, oh. Is this thing dangerous? At the peak of their income, the two of them made, and keep in mind this is the late 90s, over $200,000. They enjoyed traveling, especially Renette. <laughs> the most exciting place for her to be is in an airport because she's either coming from somewhere or going somewhere. She loved to travel. She always did love to travel. What was interesting is that then she did make it into a job. She decided that she wanted to start uh, doing some tour guide uh, uh, business. Renette had a dramatic career switch. One day, and it was literally one day, she decided she didn't want to be a pharmacist anymore and wanted to be a tour guide. On the night she died, Renette had just returned from a six-week tour of Italy. <laughs> well, I met, I met her at the gate. Went, went up to her and gave her a big hug and a kiss. And... Bergner's account of the conversation on the ride home raises even more concerns. One of the first things that Bergness says is how lonely he is because his wife is gone all the time and how unhappy he is with all of her travel. All he wants to talk about are the problems and his marriage and the irritants and the aggravations that he experienced with this woman. My wife is home with me. That's important to me in my life. He had a list of, uh, of things he wanted to cover with his wife. Recovered from his pocket the night of the crash was a piece of paper he'd titled agreement to improve our marriage. This is basically a list of goals, a, a contract, if you will, and he enumerates uh, all these things that he wants to accomplish, pay their bills better, love other people, and make love more often. Bergner then suggests they take a romantic detour. I said, uh, let's go up to our favorite spot that's up West White Mountain. Bergner tells Beltron that they drive up this winding road to the top of the mountain, and there he parks at a dead end at a ski resort. Slide Mountain, Bergner tells Beltron, is the perfect place to discuss his marital wish list with Renette. And my thought in my mind was, it, it's quiet, it's romantic, it's beautiful. She loves to go up and look the lights in my head. It was there, Bergner says, that he pleaded his case. It really hurts me. I, 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 I hate to be home alone. I want you to be home with me. This is what I want for our life. And we started talking about, about that. Okay, how does she feel about this? She understood. She totally understands that. The end result is she told me flat out, if you want me to stay home, I will stay home and I will not travel. Then Peter has another suggestion. Let's go on down to the spot where you can see Reno. So Bergner then starts up the truck and starts driving down the road near where the guardrail is so he can look at the lights. I got down that way and I started to down, down the road a little bit. And then I started to break. And I started to break. And I started to break. And it wasn't breaking. It wasn't stopping. I couldn't forget why it was stopping. And then you know, I hit the guardrail. I mean, that doesn't make sense. When you're leaving and you see that your brakes aren't working to pull down in that area, I just don't know why you wouldn't quarter turn the wheel. But a simple quarter turn would pull you straight away from the edge. Instead, it looked like the, the truck had gone straight through. And that's not the only problem with Bergner's story. After Bergner tells the detectives that this is one of the favorite places for he and his wife to look at the lights, he then almost immediately contradicts himself. I've been there before with her. I haven't been there before with her. I, I go there all the time. I don't go all there. Bergner says that as he was tumbling down the hill, he tried to spot his truck or a fire. What fire? Why would you look for a fire? That was one of the first things that he said that just, you know, sent a, you know, a red flag, if you want. They ask about the three gas cans from the debris trail. All were missing their caps. There was a lot of gas and oil pretty much all up and down the hillside. Investigators determined that the gas came from the open cans in Bergner's truck. Why would somebody put 
fuel cans in the back of their truck filled up that had a hole in them that the fuel could easily escape from. He said that uh, he had 11 gallons of extra gas because he was going to go to a trip to Vegas for a jewelry show and didn't want to stop in Vegas to fill up. At this point in the interview, one of the detectives decides to throw a curveball to Peter Bergna and tells him that somebody else was up there and heard everything. The detective tells Bergna that he and Renette weren't the only ones at Slide Mountain that night. It was baloney. It was a total cop trick. There was no caretaker. There was nobody there. They just wanted to see how Bergna would react. The strategy pays off. I mean, he looked like he just got hit with a left hook because he had no clue that somebody was there or wasn't there. So I think that threw him a real big curve. Bergner then changes the subject abruptly. I'm a very respected person around town. I love my wife dearly, and I'm just sick to, sick to death, and I'm, I'm going to be alone. Just... Lonely, lonely, lonely. Yeah, my biggest fear is but... I don't want to be alone. You know, you would think that he was crying. But then uh, the lack of emotion he had, I mean, he'd, he'd go through all the crying, make the noises and everything else, but not shed a tear. He, he never shed a tear. That in itself was very strange. Either the grieving husband had cried himself out, or he was hiding a dark secret. Suspicion was mounting. But if anyone knew how to swerve his way out of trouble, it was Peter Bergner. Several weeks after the death of Renette Bergner, police are suspicious that whatever happened on Slide Mountain was no accident. Yep. Oh, almost immediately hit car. Okay, same thing. Yeah, jump a little, little, little further over. Pretty close. Detectives take a closer look at the Bergner's marriage. What started to bug me more than anything was the fact that he, as time went on, he treated my sister worse in public. He didn't physically do anything to her, but he put her down. He belittled her. Peter may have considered himself the toast of Tahoe, but to his in-laws, he was a pretentious, name-dropping creep. One Christmas, he stormed away from the dinner table, cursing that Renette had put the wrong cheese in the pasta. Clearly, this was not a marriage made in heaven. I had the sense that she wasn't happy living there with her husband. And I'd also heard an increasing frequency of arguments between Renette and Peter. One day, she saw Renette walking out of the house and Peter with a snowblower blowing snow all over his wife. Peter just pulled the snowblower right up beside her and blasted her with the stream of snow on her face and all over her body. He was just attacking her with the snowblower. The Renette was always making excuses for him. But my sister wasn't going to, for lack of a better way to put it, admit defeat in the marriage. Renette's solution was to quit her job as a pharmacist and become a full-time travel guide. She was looking for a way to be gone for part of the year. I think the traveling gave her a reprieve from the troubles that they were having. <laughs> In many ways, Renette's career change gave her the divorce that her devout Catholicism wouldn't allow. But Peter's only concern was the bottom line. Peter did not react well to Renette's career switch. First, he didn't like the reduction in income. He liked money. He liked the lifestyle. He wanted a better lifestyle. But the problem was, Renette was making way less money. He wanted a house on the lake with a view. The houses where you really wanted to live were down on the waterfront, on the lakefront. Where he lived was a little bit up the hill. They were still very nice houses, but they weren't the elite homes. Lucky Peter. The crash earned him $250,000 in life insurance money. His dream house was suddenly in reach. 
there was also a $200,000 add-on for an accidental death. So Renette's death in insurance alone was worth nearly half a million dollars. Bergner got his payout within months of Renette's death and wasted no time spending it. A new car, I believe a new car for his secretary, a pickup, trips, um, a wine collection. One of Peter's otter purchases was a new Ford F-150 to replace the one that had plunged Renette over the edge. Brand loyalty is one thing. But this was a pretty outrageous move. Well, that one kind of blew me away. If I just lost my spouse in a car, I certainly would not turn around and buy that same model. And he did. And the insurance payout wasn't the only way that Bergner would profit from his wife's demise. Overlapping the insurance was Renette stood to inherit land, family land, from her brothers. Renette's share of the Riella family's property in Central California was valued at around $250,000. And he wanted a lot more money than he had coming. Peter kept pressing and pressing and pressing. He wanted this money. He informed me that he had lost my sister's income for the next 11 to 13 years, and he needed to get all the money he could from us. And that's the most miserable feeling in the world. And then your alternatives either pay the guy off or you have him as your partner. So we paid him off. It was one of the hardest things I ever did. The Riella brothers ended up writing Peter Bergna a check for $275,000. Renette's family thought that was $275,000 in blood money they gave to Peter Bergna. You think this guy killed your sister? And then you got to do business with this guy. I'll never forget that till I, till the day I die. I, that's the moment that I knew for sure. <laughs> Hello, Peter. Come on, Peter. Oh, oh, oh. I knew at that point that he killed my sister. In late 1998, almost five months after the suspicious death of Renette Bergner, her husband Peter is the prime suspect. The one-time bon vivant is now the pariah of Incline Village. People began to see Peter as somebody capable of killing his own wife and trying to cover it up. He never talked about Renette in a remorseful or, you know, like you would mourning someone that you really loved. Here's this guy who not only was involved in this rather unsavory accident that was gaining negative publicity for him and the town, but he wasn't grieving, he wasn't mourning. A lot of people around town were calling him the Incline OJ. With its private beaches and manicured golf courses, Incline Village prides itself on its sterling reputation, a reputation that the bushy-browed murder suspect had begun to sully. Bergner could feel the stairs everywhere he went. He knew it was time to get out. He went to Seattle. That's where he had gone to college, and, and he brought his little appraiser business up with him to Seattle. Bergner begins a new life with a new girlfriend. Meanwhile, the investigation of Renette's death is at an impasse. I felt very frustrated that law enforcement wasn't acting sooner to arrest him. Part of the problem was they didn't have that great a case. They didn't have a witness. They didn't have any strong forensic evidence. They certainly didn't have an admission. I've done nothing, nothing wrong. I've done nothing wrong. Washington 6, Adam 60. But investigators haven't given up. We're starting to build a package on him to basically say, this, there's Peter Bergner that people know, there's a Peter Bergner that people don't know. They re-examine his interviews, and even more inconsistencies emerge. I, I drive all the time. I'm a good driver. I don't know why I didn't stop. 
Peter was his own worst enemy in these interviews. Especially when he starts defending his marriage. And he said it more than once in more than one way. I don't cheat, I don't go out to bars. I don't cheat, I don't go out to bars. I'm not out trying to, you know, meet other women, so forth. You know, I'm a family man, I don't cheat. Well, you're certainly trying to. As investigators find out, Peter had a wandering eye before his wife's death. It just gave me the willies. He would come and stand at the end of his driveway and stare up at my friends and I when we were in the hot tub. And it was uncomfortable for us. It wasn't the only time Cindy felt Peter was on the prowl. He came over and said, your husband sure is out of town a lot. I didn't know if he wanted to kill me or f me, basically. It was, it was kind of flirtatious, but kind of threatening, too. Detectives learn about Peter's behavior at a party the night before Renette Bergner died. He said his wife was in Europe. He said that she was coming back tomorrow. She'd been gone for six weeks. Bergner took a shine to one of Judy's girlfriends. She was feeling uncomfortable. She says, look, get this guy away from me. He goes, he won't keep his hands off me. He won't stay away from me. Bergner persisted. But he did offer to take her home or he, to stay at his place. She said no. Investigators found out after the accident that Peter was already trying to re-spark his love life if he hadn't even started before. And he was hitting on these blonde banker women who he ran into in his work. He was bringing women over fairly soon afterwards, certainly within months of Burnett's death. One woman he invited into his hot tub. He went to put his arm around me, and I started to move away, and he pulled me back closer to him and reached for my left breast. At that point, I just panicked, and I says, I gotta go home. I was terrified. After he grabbed me, it was like he wasn't gonna stop, and he had this mean look on his face that scared me half to death. I thank the good Lord I just got the hell out of there made police very suspicious because he wasn't acting like a man who's grieving over the loss of his wife. He was, he was acting like a player just weeks later. But lechery and bad taste don't necessarily add up to murder. Desperate for more evidence, investigators re-examine the forensic evidence from the crime scene. I'm hitting the brakes, we're not stopping, we're not stopping. They autopsy the truck, they pull it apart, and what they found was nothing. The mechanic that goes over the truck finds nothing wrong with the brakes. Reviewing the case files, they find an overlooked clue. Bergner's hat that had ended up just off the pavement where the truck went through the guardrail. Now, if I open the door, I went out the window. I have no idea. I have no idea. You know what you did? But that claim raises an obvious question for investigators. How did the hat end up at the top of the hill, and everything else ended up down the hill. You know, Newton's laws of motion. An object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by a force. If you're going 20 miles per hour, and you crash through the guardrail, and your hat flings off, the hat is also going 20 miles per hour. This hat could not have just stopped while the car, Peter, and everything else, and his wife went down the hill. To prosecutors, this meant that Peter bailed out of the truck before it went over. And then we, we got to the clothing that Mr. Bergner was wearing that night. When you looked at the tennis shoes, the sides of them had some cuts in them. And in those cuts was a black residue. I said, that's asphalt. It's, it looks just like asphalt. The shoes are sent to a lab to have the residue tested. It turned out to be asphalt very much like the asphalt on the road at the top of that hill. Well, the asphalt ends at the guardrail. So that was an extremely important part. There's really no way for him to get asphalt on his shoes if he was ejected on the dirt hillside. Police figured that he bailed out of the truck, scuffed it on the pavement, hurt his foot, and the truck went on down the hill without him. The shoes turn out to be the final straw. 
prosecutors now felt they had enough evidence to nail Peter Bergman. It was sort of two pillars. Peter's statement full of arrogance, patronizing statements, implausible explanations, and all this circumstantial evidence, the two of them made for a powerful case. In 2000, more than two years since the fatal crash, prosecutors charged Peter Bergna with the murder of his wife, Renette. I said, hi, Mr. Bergna, do you remember me? And he said, yes, I do. And I, he goes, I know what you're here for. And we placed him under arrest. In May 2002, four years after the crash, Peter Bergna faces the music in a Reno, Nevada courtroom. The state has assembled a mountain of evidence against the defendant, but all of it is circumstantial. I woke up, I looked for a fire. He looked for a fire because that was what he was hoping would happen, folks. He was hoping these open leaking gas cans would have exploded and ignited that car. Though Peter isn't expected to take the stand, the prosecution uses his own words against him. I was thrown out and flying down the hill. He never took the stand, but he was very much in that courtroom from the 911 tape. Uh, 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 uh. Peter's words sunk him. Peter was his own worst witness. I'm trying to hang out with one arm. Hang on. I'm sliding down the hill. Oh, oh, oh. You're back? It's pitch black up there. There isn't any lights at all. You're sliding down a cliff. You can't see where you're headed. And you're going to pull a phone out of your pocket while you're sliding, trying to save your life? Just the, the fine motor skills you have to do to dial a phone. I don't care if it's 911. You still have to, while you're falling, tripping, turning, do that. How did he hold on to his cell phone? It seemed impossible. It was a joke. <laughs> Prosecutors contend that Bergna's 911 call was a well-staged performance. Sir, sir, calm down. Where are you? Sir, sir, I need you to calm down. Where are you? I'm on the side of the mountain, off the, off the edge. He was stalling as long as he could to make sure she died. Sir, we need to get someone out, you, out to help you. You need to tell me where you're at. He had him going for 15, 20 minutes trying to find him. He knew where he was. He knew exactly where he was. He lives there. I need you to take a couple breaths and then tell me where you're at. My car's right down the hill. My wife is in the car. You wouldn't do that to an animal. And he did it to my sister. It's not a pleasant thing to think about. To a lot of people following the case, Peter Bergner was guilty as sin. But with his sorrowful expression and charcoal pinstripe suit, he tried to cut a respectable and sympathetic figure. All he needed was for one juror to buy the act. I think the defense's biggest problem was that they put on as big a defense as they did. They tried to explain in detail this car crash. The defense spends thousands of dollars on 3D computer modeling, but to many in the gallery, it's just smoke and mirrors. It didn't make any sense. He literally would have had to dramatically turn right, speed up, crash through the guardrail, and then somehow fling himself or be flung from the car. When they brought up the three experts, to reconstruct the alleged ejection of Peter Bergner from the car, it didn't make sense to anybody in the courtroom. No branches, no twigs, no leaves, and very, very little dirt that these people noticed on a person that supposedly got ejected out the window and rolled uncontrollably down the hillside. Prosecutors contend that every move Bergner made that night was carefully planned. He had every intention of picking his wife up at the airport that night, taking her up to the hillside, and staging that event to look like an accident and killing his wife. They argue that Bergner jumped out of his truck as it sped towards the guardrail, Renette strapped inside. I hope that she was either asleep 
or passed out or knocked out or something, but I don't like to go there. To do something on top of what he did, you know, to think that he did something else, it's just too much. There's all kinds of things that could have happened up there. And there's only two people on that mountain, and uh, one is dead, only one knows. After eight weeks of testimony and two days of deliberations, the jury is ready to deliver their verdict. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter, find the defendant, Peter Matthew Bergna, guilty of murder. And to describe it, it was like they talk about a weight lifted off your chest. It physically. never felt like that in my life. That fall, Bergna is back in court for sentencing. Defendant Peter Matthew Bergna is hereby sentenced to a term of life with the possibility of parole, with eligibility for parole beginning when a minimum of 20 years has been served. I don't think he feels remorse. I think he's convinced himself he didn't do anything. Every situation you can think of, about your sister in the good times, bad times, any times, always ends with her death. It always ends with what happened there on June 1st. Every June 1st, I take flowers up to the, the area. I don't do that for anybody else. And so I think she deserves it. He was a control freak, and that's what made him so scary. That's what was behind all of this, not love, not even anger, it was control. On the surface, he was just a nice guy. Hello, Peter! The friend was the neighbor, would babysit your kids. But you get beneath that, there's a cold-blooded killer. Suffering from a lifelong superiority complex, Peter Bergna thought he could stage the perfect crime. But his murder plot turned out to be an amateur production. Today, the pompous art patron and wine snob is drinking bad lemonade out of a plastic cup. At least there's some justice in the world. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.